This episode of the Sleuth Cats is brought to you by the Med Canadian Barbecue Company. Med Canadian Barbecue Company is an Ohio based company where they usually say our seasoning will take your barbecue from good to great. Med Canadian will be in Cary this Wednesday. I'm just verifying. Yep, this Wednesday, um, September 8th in Cary from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the corner of North and Patterson. It will also be in Cary on Thursday from 3 to 7 p.m. over at Market 113, which is on East Finley Street near the intersection of South Van Street. And this Saturday, they will be in at the Tiffin Brewery located on Wall Street um, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, if you get any, forget any of that, you can check out his social medias on Twitter, on Facebook, to find out where he and his food truck are heading to next. Mad Kenny Barbecue Company, the official barbecue of the Cary High School Blue Devils. This episode of the Sloopcast also brought to you by, if I can talk into the correct part of my microphone, also brought to you by uh, the Iron Bean Coffee Company. The Iron Bean Coffee Company is a premium small batch roast order, veteran owned, Ohio based, hand roasted, roast to order coffee company. They be roasting, I guess is what I'm saying. They be roasting, they be roasting things the right way. They're all of their beans are fair trade certified. All of their beans are USDA organic. Integrity is at the core value of what they do. All of their beans imported straight from far off places like Colombia, Brazil, Uganda, Honduras, Peru, Ethiopia, Indonesia. Uh, some of their most popular coffees are available in K Cup. Gift cards are available, free shipping over $50. And of course, there is a subscribe and save service should you find that one coffee you love the most. All of that and more can be found at ironbeancoffee.com. That's Iron Bean Coffee, America's local coffee roaster. How's it going, YouTube? How's it going, going our Sloop Cats in our Discord? They're trying to, I feel like they're already conspiring against us again. Trying to make us laugh. I hope, I hope everybody's kind of settled down after this weekend. Uh, there was it was very hot and heavy um, after Thursday night. Oh, a lot you of know. <laughs> a lot, a lot of reactionary folk. Mm -hmm. But hopefully, hopefully things have kind of cooled down after seeing everybody else play. <laughs> yeah, unless of course you watched Bama play, but we'll talk about that in the Tuesday episode. We're talking strictly Ohio State this episode. Yep. All right. Yeah. Well, let's get true, into it. True stuff, Gangland. We've got barbecue back here. You're all invited. Welcome to the Sloopcast. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing pretty well. How are you doing today, Jared? I feel fine. I feel good. I feel I feel like we got that week one of football behind us. Um and I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty good. Um I mean, if you want to just jump straight into it, and hey, why wouldn't we jump straight into it? We're doing these shorter format shows now. Um Ohio State, I feel like, looked good. Did they look great? No. Uh, but they looked good. I think they lived up to expectations. They covered. They absolutely covered, and that's that's important. Um, so they met expectations from that standpoint. Um, the offense was shaky. Um, CJ Stroud had a, a rough first half, but I think came back really nicely in the second half. I thought the offensive line looked great. Um, the defense struggled against the run, but we we told you that was going to happen. We told you what Minnesota was capable of doing. If you go back and listen to the Know Your Enemy of uh, last week, I, I don't. None of that. I I didn't find anything about this game surprising. I think what I found more surprising was the number of players not playing. There was a few. There's there's quite a few, few including uh, Cameron Brown, uh, Harry Miller, yeah, and then a surprise like surprise right at the right at the very end up until kickoff. Seven banks, you you are you are out two defensive backs, and we talked about this all last year. How tough it was going to be for Ohio State to cover. Uh, a lot of the 
the wide receivers in are we in round two of this again here i don't i don't think so the seven banks thing was uh so like cameron brown not that big of a surprise i've been telling you guys all off season he's a cornerback less than a year out from a devastating achilles injury i'm not surprised he didn't play in week one I, i'm just i'm not that surprised by it mm-hmm. well Harry we'll, we'll Miller right was that was news that broke that he didn't travel with the team early on Thursday. So that was a that was a surprise. Luke Whipler, I thought, comes in, plays excellently. I uh, don't think Ohio State missed a beat. I didn't notice Luke Whipler was in the game, which is exactly what you want from a center. Exactly what you want from a center is to just be like, oh, I forgot that he even played that. That's what you want. Um, and then seven banks was not even on the injury report. Seven Banks was out dressed with the team at the beginning of warmups. And we don't yeah. have any official anything about exactly what happened there. Uh, you know, we're, we're recording this on a Sunday. It's going to come out on Monday morning. We don't have the Ryan Day, I almost said over my, we don't have the Ryan Day press conference yet. And even then it's an injury, so he's not going to say anything about it. So even if we had a yeah. quote from Ryan Day, it would it would be mostly meaningless. Yeah, I mean, Whippler comes in just not missing a beat here. Uh, I think uh, Nomad mentioned, I think only one muffed snap all game. And as an offensive lineman altogether, zero sacks allowed. Right. And Minnesota has a, a really nice pass rusher who we talked about in the Know Your Enemy section of the or in the Know Your Enemy episode last week. And where was he? Exactly. Um, nothing. If, if Ohio State and they will figures out how to execute at an Ohio State level, there's no one in the Big Ten who's going to stop them from scoring. We saw some good defensive performances this week in the big 10, namely um, from Penn state and from Wisconsin. And they, they might be able to slow Ohio state down, but they're not going to stop them. Ohio state, Ohio state's going to be unstoppable in the big 10. There are some national teams again, who looked really good this weekend, but we'll, we'll figure that stuff out as we go. Yeah. That, I don't think we even mentioned it here. So Ohio State wins 45 to 31 over Minnesota. You look at the stats here, uh, pretty even a lot of here, a lot of the stats you look here. Um, Ohio State had about almost 100 more total yards, but rushing wise, both Ohio State and Minnesota had exact amount of um, yardage. Penalties were the same. Uh, Ohio State was plus one to their turnovers. Minnesota had quite a few more first downs and held on to the ball for well over um, almost a quarter and a half longer <laughs> than Ohio state did too. So Minnesota playing the kind of game they really wanted to that holding on to the ball, preventing, preventing Ohio state offense from getting on the field. I mean, what was it like Ohio state had like, it feels like they only had like three uh, drives in that first half for how long Minnesota held on to that ball. That first half, it was, that might be accurate. That's what it felt like. Um, uh, Gangland says five. Five. Well, it felt like three. Yeah. (laughs) It felt like three. But yeah, no, it's... So I'm looking here, one, two, three, four. So they had a touchdown on the first drive, field goal on their second drive, interception on the third, and punt on the fourth. Gangland says that that was punts. I don't know. One of you are right. I'm not, I'm not going to waste time figuring it out. Um, now, yeah, it's, only 50. It's all fine. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's all fine though. So, but yeah, as, as Jared mentioned at the top of the show um, with, I think the big thing that everybody was curious about was CJ Stroud. How is he going to do with the, the number of great quarterbacks Ohio State's had in previous years? How well was he going to come into it? And First drive, we thought like, hey, he he looked pretty good. But then after that first drive, it was kind of a, eh. Yeah. The rest of the rest of that first half, and I don't want to be a a downer here, but I I know everybody was 
really used with him in that second half, but the second half, he only threw the ball eight times <laughs> that second half. He was five for eight the second half and like 200 yards. So that tells right. you that he, he just bought, well, not, not really necessarily bombed them, but got into his playmakers hands and they did the rest there. Which by the looked, way he, is all we need from CJ Stroud. It is. I mean, it Bama yeah. has won national titles with court with substandard quarterbacks who just give the ball off to the talented guys around them. And, and by the way, I'm not saying CJ Stroud is a substandard average, whatever quarterback I'm saying he's a true freshman in his very first start. And the way Ryan day is going to work around some of this true freshman struggle is by throwing a screen pass to Henderson and letting him take it. Was it 70 yards? I forget, but yeah, it was that 71 yard. Yeah. 71 yards. That's, that's how you, that's how you work around the freshman red shirt, freshman year struggles that you're going to get from CJ Stroud early in these games until he gets his feet, until he gets some experience, until that game starts to slow down for him. It's fine. If you are expecting, he's not as good as Justin Fields. No shit. He's not going to be, especially in his first start at Ohio state. It's fine. He looked fine. You know what? You know what's you know what the best part is? The best thing I can say about CJ Stroud is he struggled early, but he kept his composure. He came back, he played well, he didn't let it snowball mentally into something it wasn't or didn't need it to be. He came back in the second half and he lit things up. Now, did he lit things up with a whole lot of assistance from the talented guys around him? Absolutely. But guess what? Those talented guys aren't going anywhere. They're going to be around him all season. They'll really need him to be like the next level of quarterback next year. When you lose, presumably, Garrett Wilson, when you lose Olave, when you lose a large chunk of this offensive line. Then you're going to need him to step up a little bit more. But right now, if you can get away with throwing screen passes to Henderson and 10 yard out patterns to Wilson and Olave, then that's fine, especially in the first half of this year. You get into playoff time. Well, guess what? Playoff time. He's got, you know, 13 or so games in his pocket. He's no longer like a, like a red shirt freshman at that point. He's basically a red shirt sophomore at that point. Yeah, and in all honesty, too, having him go through this game, first game of the year, being away, night came, hostile environment, especially through, even if you look at everything non-football, what that city Minnesota has gone through, that was such a that was such a, a bit of a stretch. <laughs> yeah, well, that was <laughs> such a an intense environment. It's a, it's a bit of a stretch, Kyle, too to invoke everything that Minnesota has gone through in the past year and a half. But I, I get what you're saying. Like, but, but had them, him experiencing that, that type of game in preparation for what's coming up here next week, which will, will come into, um, um, I think Friday's episode, I think we'll do it Friday's episode um, where we'll, we'll review the Ohio state Oregon game. I think this is probably the best scenario for him to, Get uh, into, Thursday. Um, know your enemy. Thursday. Our Thursdays. Yep. Yes, you're right. Um, yeah, I think this is just the best type of game that has that CJ Stroud could have in preparation for that Oregon. Instead of having a a Mac type of game where he could just throw up big numbers, he he had issues and came out the second half and played a lot better. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, and I I like I like. I like that Ohio State had a challenging game off the bat, and I really like Minnesota. I come out of this game. I went into the game liking Minnesota. I come out of the game really liking Minnesota. I still think they have defensive issues. Don't get me wrong, but their defense played better than I was expecting, and their offense is as advertised, and that's that's saying a lot because their offense came highly advertised. They get their best wide receiver back on the field. That'll help. They have all of those offensive linemen. They're not going anywhere. That'll help. 
now we don't know what the situation is right now with Ibrahim. Um, Ibrahim. Um, I we don't know what that situation is right now. There was an early report saying that he had ruptured his Achilles, and I don't I don't see that being true. The way he was able to sort of hop at least part of the way back to the sideline, um, the way he was able to walk back to the locker room wearing a boot like it. It does look like an Achilles injury. If you watch the replay, it's exactly what it looks like. But I, I don't think it's a rupture of the Achilles, a strain, a sprain, something not great. You never that's this very important tendon. Like you, you don't want it to be hurt, but I, I don't think I don't think it's a rupture by any means. So we'll yeah. see. We'll see where he's at. Well, hopefully, hopefully it's not too bad and he gets to see the field again this year. Yeah, hopefully. hopefully. All right. Um, let's see here. Do we want to take a quick break here? Yeah, we can take a quick break. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the defense. We'll talk a little bit. Then we'll talk a bit. Yeah, we'll talk about the defense. We'll hand out some grades and we'll do some Ask Sloopcast on the other side of this break. All right. Sounds good. So let's go ahead and hear from our good friends over at the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. Mix it up here for you, Jerry. Yeah, you threw me <laughs> Med up Canadian is an Ohio-based company located in Cary, Ohio. Um, they want everybody to know that they have a food truck that they go to periodically in the northwest Ohio area, sometimes the northern part. But if you pester him, maybe he'll come to your town um, in the future. Um, but this Wednesday and Thursday, they'll be in Cary, Ohio on Wednesday from 4 to 7 p.m., corner of North and Patterson. On Thursday, between 3 and 7 p.m., they'll be at the Market 113, which is which is on East Finley Street, uh, near the intersection of South Vance Street. And then this uh, Saturday, so you can get you can get some of uh, Mad Canadian uh, food before the Ohio State or or after the Ohio State Oregon game uh, up at Finley or excuse me Tiffin Ohio at the Tiffin Brewery, which is located on Wall Street. Forget any of anything that I said here. Check out his social medias, Facebook, Twitter. Find out where him and his food truck are heading to next. Med Canadian Barbecue Company, who are the official barbecue of the Cary High School Blue Devils. This episode of the Sloopcast also brought to you by uh, the Iron Bean Coffee Company. I spent uh, a lot of last week talking about their uh, standard coffees, their non-flavored coffees. So let's talk some flavored coffees. Uh, there's the Dylan's Grog. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's an Irish grog. It's a, a lot of, I feel like, most people who like coffee are familiar uh, with with the grog. Um, this is the Iron Bean Coffee's version of it. I feel like it's like the IPA of coffees, where it is like if you're a brewery or in this case, a roaster worth your two cents as a company, then, of course, you have a grog, right? Uh, they also have an intense blueberry, which is exactly what it sounds like. The mom's carrot cake. Uh, they have a mint chocolate chip coffee and they also have the unicorn coffee. Uh, unicorn coffee, you never know what's going to be in the unicorn coffee. You just you you never know. It's a flavored coffee. Um, but you is it going to be like a blueberry crumble? Is it going to be a you never know? It's it's a research and development coffee. It's it's completely up in the air. You have no idea what's going to be in, in that guy. And if you're looking for even more flavored coffees, then you can check out the backroom selection over at the Iron Bean Coffee Company under their Murder Coffee brand, uh, where they have a vanilla butter cream, a red velvet cake, a ginger snap, and a blueberry cinnamon crumble. So you can check out all of that and more at ironbeancoffee.com. That's Iron Bean Coffee, America's local coffee roaster. Before we go into the defense, Jared, um, got we got to mention the running backs, though. Yeah, uh, my mine mine Williams uh, starts the game. Surprisingly, mine Williams with the most carries for Ohio State with nine. I'm not <laughs> nine the least surprised by rushes, that. Yeah, rushes it for 125 yards and a touchdown, averaging just under 14 yards per carry. Amazing, amazing work for as what a lot of people call him Chop, Pork Chop. Yeah, for Chop Williams. Uh, and then, you know, you almost want to kind of cheat for Henderson a bit and give him credit for give him rushing yard credit for that screen pass uh, as maybe all but one or two of those yards was was on the ground. Uh, that was an amazing play. 
Um, we, we didn't see a ton of Master Teague. We saw Crowley with some cleanup time at the end. And by the way, we, like we haven't mentioned the receivers in case you haven't figured it out yet. Alave and Wilson are great. Alave, probably game, uh, probably player of the game for Ohio State on offense. But it, all, it just almost feels. It almost feels repetitive at this point to just say, hey, Chris Olave is great. Now, just the fact that we aren't talking about it doesn't make it not true. It's just that what else is there to say? The dude is always open. He's always open by like 10 yards and he, he makes magic after the catch. And everything I said about Chris Olave can also be said about Garrett Wilson. Well, that, that was that was very similar with uh, a lot of the plays, too. If you look at back at if you watch the game again, you'd see a lot of the receivers just wide open, too. I know I know uh, JSN was open quite a bit, too, even though yeah. he only had two receptions. It's just that everybody was able to get wide open. Yeah. Especially like, in that second half. Yeah. And like like we said in the Know Your Enemy episode for Minnesota, we we knew. Like we knew Minnesota's secondary wasn't great. And so we 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 knew. Uh but that again, that doesn't take away from the fact that we also saw these three guys do that against Clemson last year. Yeah. All right. Defensively here. Uh, what stuck out the most for you, Jared? So one, they got, they got destroyed. They got destroyed in the running game. Now, does that concern me? No. Ibrahim, amazing running back. That offensive line has six guys, six guys who could play in the NFL. All of them seniored four-year, five-year, six-year seniors playing on that offensive line, going six deep. There were times, and not to say this happened all the time, but there were times in which they had eight offensive linemen on the field. Minnesota knew exactly who they were, and they played into that. Yep. And they killed the clock. They kept Ohio State's offense off the field. They destroyed Ohio State in time of possession. There are concerns with the Ohio State run defense if you just looked at this game statistically. But I feel like it's a real outlier. It's It, it almost kind of felt like playing Navy or something like that, where, yeah, they ran. They got running yards on you. But the, I don't necessarily think that's going to be indicative of what we see in the future because this is such a outlier of an offense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we can't, we can't um, talk about the defense without mentioning uh, <laughs> as, as they said on, um, on the broadcast, uh, Haskell Garrett, what do they call it? Garrett, the um, Haskell, Rascal, the Rascal, the Garrett, which Haskell, the Rascal. Yes. I saw some people take objection <laughs> to, but w w whatever. Yeah. Um, so his, his second touchdown in as many years. We, we can't talk about that play without talking about the fact that Zach Harrison got the strip sack. So let's yes. let's give credit where credit's due. I thought Zach Harrison played. I thought I thought Zach Harrison played great. Um, I I thought that the defensive line, even given everything we saw played really well because even when there were six or seven offensive linemen on the field, they were still getting pressure and they were still getting some really nice stuffs on the run. Even if it wasn't always, I, I don't know who could hold up to that much better. I do think Ohio state has found if we're looking at their true linebackers, if we're looking at their true linebackers, I think, not so not the bullet. I do think Ohio State has found their two guys. Uh, Taraja Mitchell had the most snaps of anyone on the defense. He had 70 snaps, um, which is five more than Zach Harrison. So he had pretty much far and away the most snaps of anyone on the defense. And I thought that uh, Cody Simon really flashed when he was out there. Um, I, I've seen some people with some negative feelings about Tommy Eichenberg. Slow down. It's his first start. I don't even actually think he looked bad. I think some of you are maybe 
um, transposing some some feelings from previous linebackers on onto Tommy Eichenberg. I don't think that's fair. Um, I thought I, I thought that the defense looked good, and I know that they gave up 31 points. Um, but we told you Minnesota was going to score points. Uh, Kyle, did you predict 24 points for Minnesota's score? Uh, yeah, I had. I think I had. It was yeah. It was forty-five to twenty-four was my score. So seven more points, a yeah. t- an extra touchdown. Yeah. So like, I'm not. I saw nothing in this game that surprised me. You saw some of these young defensive backs struggle. Okay. Okay. Like one, Seven Banks wasn't out there, and we all expected him to be. If 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 he's out there, the pass defense is remarkably improved. But he wasn't. So instead of having one freshman or redshirt freshman on the field playing corner, now you have two. And that changes the equation a lot. Point is, is that I'm not worried. You get seven banks back. Cam Brown will be ready eventually, even if it's maybe not. I don't know when, but he is coming back. And these young guys, these freshmen, these redshirt freshmen, this is these were their first games and they're going to get better with experience. I, I think a lot of people forget that even the Jeffrey Akutas and the Denzel Wards struggled in their first games. And mm. when they struggled, a lot of them had the ability, the opportunity to struggle in the nickel position as opposed to being in the cornerback one position. A lot of those guys got to start their lives at like free safety or at nickelback. And that's not an opportunity that these guys are getting. So a little bit of patience for these freshmen as they as they figure things out. And it's also worth noting that these corners were being put on islands. Ohio State was loading the box because you had to. The other team was putting, like I said, six, seven offensive linemen on the field at times, which means that you had to in match up with that by bringing your linebackers and your safeties up, which means these corners were playing on islands. These are true freshmen and redshirt freshman cornerbacks playing alone on islands. So, oh, why, why are they still giving the guys so much, but a lot of people complain. Well, why are they giving them all this buffer room? Why are they giving them all this buffer room? Why, why? Because they're out there by themselves. That's why. Mm -hmm. I know you get upset when Ohio State gives up an easy seven yard pass, but you'd be more upset if they gave up an easy 70 yard touchdown. Because in many cases, the safeties were playing run first as opposed to pass first, which means the corners had to be in more of a passive position. All right, let's go ahead and give out some grades here, Jared. Okay. Uh, Let's start with the quarterback. Start with CJ Stroud. What kind of grade would you give him? Do it. Let's do a A B C D and F. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go B plus. Hmm. I, I would have said I would have said a, a solid B. I mean, given playing devil's advocate here, 13 for 22, 294, four touchdowns, and interception. He throwing it 10 plus yards. He was only three for nine, so not not that accurate throwing it deep. Uh, I, that's why I would give him a B. Um, I, th- I thought he did enough uh, to keep it to get the ball out to his playmakers, but needs to be a little bit more accurate when throwing the ball deeper. And it should also just, some of his decision his some of his decision making needs to improve. But again, first game he's a he's a redshirt freshman, so I'll give him a little bit pass, which is why I gave him a B. Well, see, the fact that he's a redshirt freshman making his first start is exactly why I gave him a B plus instead of a B. Um, and by the way, the the idea that he is uh, of of his he threw four touchdowns. By the by the way, he threw four touchdowns. Of those three, or of those three of them, the ball was thrown more than ten yards down the field. So it's not like he was throwing bubbles. Like the the Henderson touchdown was the exception. It was a screen mm-hmm. pass. Henderson did all the work, but. The other balls, the other touchdowns were all thrown down the field. Now, did the uh, the, the wide receivers do a lot of stuff after the play? Absolutely, they did. But it's not like these were bubble screens that or 
or uh, shovel passes that were taken yard by talented wide receivers. These balls were thrown down the field. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Running back. Running back, I, I'd give it an A. On those, touchdowns, I thought, I thought one... on those touchdowns, Stuart, I would say three or four of them were hit in stride. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there was any situations where we saw the wide receiver waiting for the ball. Yeah. Uh, running backs, I, I would give the running backs an A. I thought they did an yeah. excellent job. Absolutely. A, a for the running All backs. Right. All right. Wide receivers, Go again, slow I would give them bit. an A. Sorry, I'm responding uh, to the chat. Uh, wide receivers, I'd give an A minus. I thought they did really well. I'd give an A minus for the wide receivers. A minus? Mm -hmm. Love a two touchdowns. Wilson gets a touchdown. Um, you know, they're no, I, I'm giving them a I'm giving them a, a solid straight A. Okay. Maybe, maybe just my expectations for them is a little bit higher, but <laughs> Uh, tight, tight ends, tight ends here. So I don't know, like, did Rucker have a great receiving day? No, but he had what was like the quintessential block on the Mayan Williams long touchdown run. He has improved considerably as a blocker. Like we can't, we can't fall into the trap of grading the tight ends exclusively on receiving performance. Uh, like I I'm fine with like an A minus or a B plus. Jeez. Well, I'm giving, I'm giving them an A. I, I thought they did a really good job. I thought they did really well. And the offensive line, I give them an A plus. I mean, they had like no, they, no sacks gave, gave, um, CJ so much time to throw the ball. I mean, what, what more can you ask for this, um, offensive line? Uh, he was only pressured on, I, be, I I think it was only six pressures on the quarterback. Yes, there was. Yep. And if we talk, and we can't talk about how great the running backs did without talking about how great the offensive line did. So yeah, A plus total A plus for the offensive line. Yep. All right. Defensive side, the defensive line. Considering they're playing against six, seven men, offensive fronts, uh, they scored a touchdown between Harrison and Haskell Garrett, they, they tanned them up for a touchdown. Um, I thought they got an appropriate amount of pressure, but they, but the, the number of rushing yards they gave up is the number of rushing yards they gave up. So I, I can't go too overwhelming here. Um, like a B plus. Okay. Yeah. I was, my, my first one was about a B a lot of rushing yards, but score did score a touchdown did make stops when they need to yeah i i give them a solid b for me now linebackers here linebackers were a big surprise to me i i thought they played really well yeah uh plugged up the holes a lot uh they didn't really make too many they didn't really allow too many long plays so i'd give i'd, I'd give them a, like a b plus i thought they did really well yeah and i think even like the one long run that they gave up. And maybe you can blame this on a play call or maybe whatever else. They 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 were basically on a blitz crashing the line, so you can't even put that on them. That was a defensive back who who missed Ibrahim in the hole. Um, considering their inexperience. Um, the what the one downside with the linebackers, and we saw this Quite a bit, especially in that first half, a lot of missed tackles. OK, but when you talk about missed tackles, you also you have to take that into consideration. One, how well positioned are they? And if they have to fight off a block, you're not if you're in the midst of fighting off a block to make a tackle, you're not making the tackle from the optimum position to make a tackle. It's not like you're sitting mm -hmm. in the hole waiting for them Two, Muhammad Ibrahim, like. Yeah. If you're missing tackles, a large part of that is the running back you're playing against. So considering all the challenges they get, they were facing in this game. Did they play a perfect game? No, but I'm still going to give them like a B, I think. Yep. OK. All right. And I gave a B plus uh, uh, the corners, the cornerbacks. Yeah. Um, you want to 
for all, for all the reasons I already talked about, for all the reasons I already talked about, they had a lot going against them. Youth, inexperience, the fact that they were being put on islands because the defense was going so anti-run. Um, if if this were a more experienced cornerback room, I'd be tempted to give them a C, a C plus. But you have to give them some leeway because they're so young. Um, so I think I'm going to bump them up to maybe like a B, B minus. How do you feel? B, okay. B minus. Yeah, I was saying I was saying a B minus. Yeah, I was saying a B minus. Stuart, and it's not the, it, the grabbing's fine as long as it's not called. That's all I'll say. Yep. The safeties. Um, I thought Josh Proctor had a really nice game. I think he sometimes too frequently goes for a big hit as opposed to just making a tackle. Um, I thought that the bullets, if we're sort of considering what the what the bullets are, if they're safeties, I thought they played an OK game. Um, only one big play given up like a like a was the Ibrahim run as far as like a real breakaway play. Um, yeah, so, I don't have any complaints for the safeties. I'll say like a B plus. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I was, that's what I have written down too. I have a B plus. And then the last one, special teams. I have nothing to say about the special teams. So in a way, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's good then. So oh, made the one field. Them, the kickoffs were fine. Made the one field goal. Um, punting could work. The they have a little bit was, of a better. Yeah, the first part yeah. was bad, but <laughs> well, I'd give a, I'd give them an A. I mean, they, yeah. they the special teams did what they need to do. No miss, no miss kicks. The punts were okay. I'll say like an A minus. Okay, all right, all right. Let let's hurry up here and let's do some quick ask Swiftcast questions here. All right. Uh, Nomad 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 asks Mayan and Trey next week. Uh, I'm going to guess that's only only mine and Trey for next week. I I I, I understand how everyone feels about Master Teague. I really feel like the hate has gone too far on Master Teague. I'm not reversing my opinion on that based off of anything I saw in the Minnesota game. Uh, that being yeah. said, Mayan looked great and Trey looked great. And maybe Master is just good compared to those two guys who look great. Um, so maybe, maybe. I, yeah, I don't. Th I think we'll still see Master Teague, but I think we might probably get a little bit more Trey, maybe Ma a little bit more Trey. I don't need to say this about Master Teague. He's kind of in a position like Jameson Williams was in, and we saw what he was able to do with with Bama. Uh, Master would start on all but like two or three Big Ten teams. Yeah. All right, uh, Becca Zach is uh simon is a legit lining back or excuse me simon is a legit linebacker weapon yes yes now he's he, still he, young, he had he's still gonna make game. mistakes but yes yeah i thought he had a really good game uh gangland asks do we hit the panic button on the defense quite yet no not at all yep yep uh ruckasaurus asks is the d line on the on the hot seat no. again no i don't think so no, again, facing six or seven offensive linemen at times. No, it's just this is not a this is not a model that other teams are going to be able to emulate. Yeah, Here, here's a good question for Buckeye Zach. Uh, what has happened to the linebackers over the years? Did the game just pass the unit by? Will Ohio State ever become LBU again? Uh. So you had a couple bad years of recruiting, a couple bad years of development. Uh, Bill Davis really set the room back by a few years. Um, and so you had some bad development. And then you just have misses. Sometimes with recruiting, you have misses. Guys just don't live up to their grades and their expectations. And that can set you back. And you have to sort of recruit over them, which I think is kind of what you're seeing right now with guys like Eichenberg and Simon young guys getting snaps right now over some older guys. So you're talking about recruiting yep. over some recruiting misses. That's what we're seeing right now with, like I said, Eichenberg and Simon getting 
so many snaps. Yep. All right. Uh, Stuart underscore E4 US vet. Is it me or did we treat Minnesota like Akron? Were we seeing what we've got when the bullets were flying? Uh, that depends upon who the we in that sentence in is. If you're thinking the fans were the fans treating Minnesota like they were Akron. Absolutely. A lot of people went in there thinking, oh, it's week one. Ohio State's going to go in there and they're going to win 56 to nothing. No, Minnesota is a legit football team. It's a team that you should absolutely beat. And they did. It's a team that you should cover against. And they did. But this was never going to be. 56 to nothing or even 56 to 10. That's not this game was never going to be that, especially when you consider the incredible amount of turnover they had on the defensive side of the ball. Yep. All right. Last question we have uh, from Nomad. How many snaps per game did Ohio State average last year on offense? Yeah. And he's I went referencing ahead and... the fact that Ohio State only had 50 snaps. And again, this was the Minnesota game plan to limit Ohio State's snaps by controlling the clock and yada, yada, yada. Kyle, I know, did some research on this one. Yeah, and they absolutely did. 50 snaps this last week. Last year, Ohio State averaged 71 uh, plays per game. 71. So you're talking about 20 less snaps, especially for how many just great players are on this offense. That's, yeah, ex exactly, Nomad. Good job by Minnesota. Yes, prevented. 20 less snaps that could have gone off for scores. Yeah. Uh, Stewart says, weren't we bland with our play calls? Um, we're, I mean, a little bit, but that, again, redshirt freshman quarterback. You trust a bigger playbook to Justin Fields than you do to any redshirt freshman quarterback. Justin Fields in year three with two and a half years of experience versus... You know, any redshirt freshman quarterback. So, yeah, it was bland -er, but you're going to see that a lot this season. It's not because they were treating it like it's Akron. It's because they have a redshirt freshman quarterback. I think you're see, you see that every year, the first game of the year. I, I think I think you see that every year. Except Virginia but. Tech. We, we unloaded on Virginia Tech. <laughs> we were we were we were going to roll that game. Yeah. All right, Kyle, that's Rolling it. That, we yep, got to end this it. episode. We're already 42 minutes in what is supposed to be a 30 minute episode. So we're out. We got to go. Kyle, do you have anything in Kyle's corner? Um, no, honestly, no. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to turn off the recording. We're going to be right back uh, for us anyway. We're going to start the recording right back up and do the Tuesday episode where we talk about uh, the national scope of what happened in college football in week one. Um, so we'll, we'll be coming back and doing that. Make sure to check out all of our links at the sloopcast.com. You'll find uh, t-shirt store stuff there. You'll find our YouTube and Twitter and Instagram and discord and Patreon, all of those links. You can find all those links just by going to the sloopcast.com. So with all of that being said, I'd like to encourage everyone to drink local beer, listen to local music. And I forgot to tell you who the band was. It's pray for sleep. The name of the band is Pray for Sleep. Um, they will be playing at Ace of Cups this Thursday, September 9th. Uh, if you don't know, Ace of Cups is in like North Campus, I suppose you would call that area. Um, uh, there's a Ray Ray. If you need additional, there's beer there and there's a Ray Ray's. Uh, uh, sorry, no, uh, sorry, sorry, Mad Canadian. I'm plugging a different barbecue truck, but you don't come to Columbus, so it's fine. Um, there's a Ray Ray's barbecue uh, truck that's uh, always right there at Ace of Cups. So you should go there and check that out as well. And um, yeah, go check out Pray for Sleep at the Ace of Cups, September 9th. Um, and we're going to play a song by them right now. So once again, this is the band is Pray for Sleep. They are Columbus based. Um, they put a high emphasis on talking about and normalizing struggles with mental health. So they get a big A plus for me in, in that realm. So once again, this is pray for sleep. And with all of that being said, I'd like to encourage everyone to drink local beer, listen to local music, and of course, support your local podcasters. Once again, this is the band pray for sleep. Stop the audio recording YouTube folks.
uh, be sure to subscribe to both us on our YouTube channel and the Buckeye Scoop YouTube channel. Those links will be popping up here in the corners any second now. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for everyone in the Discord for, for tuning in. And um, like I said, we'll see you on Tuesday with our with our national review. Peace. Thank you.